Well, this morning we have reached an exciting point in the Gospel of John. As we go through this book, we are continuing to learn more about Jesus. And at this point, we have reached our first miracle. We'll be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And it's the famous miracle where Jesus turns water into wine. One of the most famous miracles that he does, along with walking on water. There's yeah, certain parts of the Bible that lots and lots of people seem to, to know about. And this is one of them. But the interesting thing is that, that John doesn't call it a miracle. As you'll see in a minute when we read the passage, he actually calls it a sign. And he always uses that word, sign, to refer to the miracles of Jesus. Now, why do you think he does that? Let's, let's think about that for a minute. What, what does a sign do? What are signs for? There, there, there's one right there on the door. I don't know if you can see it, but this yellow sign that says, This door to remain unobstructed at all times. Now, what, what's the purpose of that sign? That sign is communicating a message, right? It's telling us a message about making sure that door is clear in case there's a fire. We can all exit that way if we need to. It's a message that tells us what to do. So that sign isn't really about that sign. It's about something else, and that's how all signs are. Signs point to things beyond themselves. The sign itself is never the point. The point is to communicate a message. So as we read this account of Jesus' first sign, I want you to think about that. Think about the message. What is this miracle communicating to us? What is this supposed to tell us? So please stand for the reading of God's word. I'll read the text for us. Again, we're in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated and join me as I pray for us. Father, we pray for your help to understand your word. We pray for insight and wisdom into this word for for a, a way to understand the meaning for your spirit to guide us into the truth and for us to respond appropriately lord we know that your word never returns void it always accomplishes the purpose the, the purpose that you have for it so we know that there's a purpose to this text for us today there's meaning here there's value and relevance and power here for our lives Lord, show us that power. Come here in power this morning. Work in our hearts and our minds. Be with me this morning. I pray that you would anoint my words and use them for your people in your glory this morning. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the great things about the Gospel of John is how explicit and clear he is. We are considering the meaning of this miracle, and John actually tells us right there in verse 11. He says that this sign manifested his glory. 
and caused his disciples to believe in him. That, I think, is the ultimate purpose of this sign, the message that the sign is communicating. It is communicating a message of the glory of Jesus. It manifests his glory. But what does it mean to manifest glory? Those aren't common words for us. People talk about manifesting in some like silly new age kind of way. Like if I just really set my mind on my goals and I really believe that I'm really going to get that job, then the universe is going to give me that job as if the universe cares about you. You know, that's what people mean by manifesting these days. But the Bible means something very, very different. And it's not just any kind of manifesting. It's manifesting his glory, the glory of Jesus. I want us to look at three things in this passage that make up the glory of Jesus. Specifically, his control over nature, his control over history, and his plans for history. So these are three things that we see in this passage. I'm going to show these to you in this passage. And they are also three aspects of the glory of Jesus. And notice what what they did. When his glory was manifested, it caused his disciples to believe in him. It, It evoked faith from them. It was a catalyst for their faith in Jesus. Do you ever feel like you need more faith? Anybody? Do you you ever think about what your life would be like if you really trusted Jesus? Do you ever think about how awesome it would be to, to rest in full confidence in God and his plans for your life? Well, if you've ever felt like you need more faith, this is how you get it. By, by an encounter with the glory of Jesus. The first way that we see the glory of Jesus manifested is in his control over nature. But I want to step back and take a more general look at his glory. Because in our culture, in our world today, we don't often talk about glory. But do you know who does? Do you know who talks about glory a lot? God does. The Bible is absolutely packed full of references to the glory of God. Often you'll see the word glory, and sometimes it'll just say that God is doing something for his namesake, or sometimes it'll say that God is doing something so that people will know that he is the Lord, or you'll see in the story that clearly God is doing something to display his power or display his justice. All of those things are equivalent. His namesake for the sake of his glory, so that people will know that he is the Lord, those are all equivalent in the Bible, all different ways to say that God is doing something for his glory. Jesus did this miracle for his glory. What you see in the Bible is that glory is the ultimate reason that God does everything. The ultimate reason that God does everything. Do you remember the Exodus, for example? That that whole incredible saga where God decimates Egypt, the most powerful nation on the planet, the most powerful rulers in the world. God decimates them and he delivers his people from slavery. The Bible says repeatedly that he did that for his glory. Or the book of Isaiah The book of Isaiah says that God created you and me, that he created all people for his glory. Think about that. Why do you exist? You exist for the glory of God. So if you need purpose in your life, if you need meaning in your life, that is your purpose. That is your meaning, to bring glory to God. In the words of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of man? Catechisms, if you're not familiar with them, we don't use them a whole lot these days, but catechisms are meant to teach people the basics of the Christian faith, the basic doctrine, basic theology. What, is the, what, what did Jesus teach? What does the Bible teach? Well, it does, catechisms usually do that by asking questions and then providing the answers to those questions. So the Westminster Shorter Catechism poses this question. What is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the ultimate purpose of man, of human beings? And the answer 
is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, it says that your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. So why did Jesus die to atone for your sins? Because he loves you? Yes. Because God's justice needed to be satisfied? Yes. But ultimately, he did it for his glory. If you have eyes to see, when you read the Bible, you will see this everywhere. When I was in my early 20s, I became fascinated by this topic. And I was doing a, a read through the Bible in a year plan or something along those lines. And I remember that year, I set out to mark every reference that referred to the glory of God. So as I went through my Bible reading that year, every single time I saw a reference to God doing something for his glory or for his namesake or, or whatever, something related to the glory of God, I wrote down the verse reference in the back of my Bible. Well, this week I, I got out that Bible and I looked in the back, the back inside cover, the blank page, and, and, and I read through some of those. I read through Ezekiel 36, 22. Isaiah 3, 8, Joshua 7, 9, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, Revelation 16, 9, and on and on and on. I counted 183 references to the glory of God, and then I stopped counting because there was a lot more. Over 183 times, the Bible refers to something, to, to God doing something for his glory. God wants people to know him, to see who he is and how awesome he is. He wants people to marvel at him and appreciate him and respect him. It's like Van Gogh's painting, The Starry Night. Anybody know that painting? I'm sure we all do. You could probably picture it in your head. It's an incredible painting, and it deserves to be appreciated and treasured because of its greatness, right? People should respect the greatness of what Van Gogh did. In a similar way, <clears throat> God is great. Therefore, God deserves to be appreciated and treasured. People should respect his greatness in who he is. You could imagine somebody buying Van Gogh's painting or buying, say, the, the Mona Lisa, the museum, for whatever reason, decides to put it on the open market and some, some insanely rich person buys the Mona Lisa and they take it to their house and they look at it and they say, wow, this is pretty cool. And they take it out to the backyard and they leave it on the table and they forget about it. <clears throat> Imagine that. Imagine how absurd that would be to take something as iconic and, and beautiful and great as the Mona Lisa and to leave it in your backyard to get rained on and get dirty and ruined, that would be a tragedy. In a similar way, it would be a tragedy if God were ignored and defamed and, and spit on and if people were to continuously turn their back on God because God is great. He deserves his due. Or you might think of it like the Grand Canyon. I think the Grand Canyon could be appropriately described as glorious. It's absolutely beautiful. It's gigantic. It's awe-inspiring. That's glory. You see, glory is composed of things like, like beauty and power, skill, justice, love. And what we know from the Bible is that God possesses all of those things to the nth degree. God possesses all of those things to the nth degree. Do you know that feeling when you admire somebody for their, their, their kindness? Or when you see somebody who's just incredibly smart and you're like, wow, they, they're just brilliant and, and it's, it's inspiring, it's cool, you, you respect that. Well, God has intelligence to the nth degree. God has compassion and love infinite, beyond our comprehension, all of the things that make us admire other people, all of the goodness that we see in others or the beauty that we see in nature or the greatness that we see in art, all of that ultimately finds its culmination in God. That's who God is. He is glorious. 
For centuries, theologians have described God as the greatest possible being. That ultimately came from Anselm, the theologian Anselm in the Middle Ages. But the idea is that that God is not just awesome. He's not just amazing or really, really great. He is literally so great that it's impossible to conceive of a being greater than God. That's what we mean by the glory of God. That's what God wants you to understand and appreciate. That he is so great, you couldn't even imagine a being greater than him. And that's one of the reasons that Jesus did this miracle. To manifest his glory. As John said in chapter 1, earlier in his introduction to this gospel, he said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So that's glory. That's what the Bible means by glory. Now let's take a closer look at it. One aspect of the glory of God, the glory of Jesus that we see in this passage, is his control over nature. Verse 7 explains clearly what happened at this event, at this wedding at Cana in Galilee. Verse 7 tells us that the servants filled the jars up with water. At the request of Jesus, they filled up these giant stone jars full of water. But when the master of the feast tasted it later on, verse 9, it had become wine. There's some ambiguity here. Did it become wine while it was still in the jars? Or did it become wine after they poured it into cups? Or did it become wine on the, as they carried it to the master of the feast, all we know is that Jesus somehow turned water into wine. And maybe that sounds a little bit simple, like some kind of parlor trick, but, but Jesus wasn't pouring packets of powder into the, into the water and mixing it together to make wine. What Jesus did was absolutely incredible. One scientist explained it like this. Jesus commanded Adam's to disassemble and reassemble in different configurations. Jesus achieved nuclear fission and nuclear fusion in a matter of moments, and he didn't even break a sweat. Think about that. Anybody ever heard of the Large Hedron Particle Collider? This giant contraption that scientists have invested decades of of hard work and research into and billions of dollars in this particle collider that they've built, the whole point of the thing is to accelerate particles in order to break them apart. Well, Jesus did it in a moment without any power source, any scientific research, and any, any, any sort of equipment. Jesus achieved nuclear fission and nuclear fusion just like that, just because he wanted to. He demonstrated complete control over nature. Complete and utter control over nature. Here we are 2,000 years later, hundreds of years into this endeavor that we call modern science, with all of these brilliant minds and all of this money and all of this technology, and we, we still can barely even achieve something like what Jesus achieved just like that. Think about that in contrast to you and me. If you spend too much time in the sun, you'll get burned. If you spend too much time in the cold, you'll get hypothermia or frostbite. If you're swimming in the ocean, you are at the mercy of the currents. You can get swept out to sea in a matter of minutes and drown. We could all be wiped out by an earthquake at any moment. A little bacteria A tiny little invisible to the naked eye bacteria could kill you in a matter of hours. We are all so small and frail and not in control. You and I are subject to nature, but Jesus controls nature. That's what this sign is telling us. Now let me give you one amazing implication of this. Jesus controls nature And he's inviting you to follow him. He's inviting you to find refuge in him, to put your trust in him, to let him run your life. 
You can rest easy in Jesus. You can find peace in Jesus because he controls all things. He controls all things. Isn't that sweet to know? That, that he can be your savior, your king, if you would submit to him. And, and honor him and follow him. And he will control all things for your good. That doesn't mean that nothing bad will ever happen to you. That doesn't mean that nothing painful or difficult will ever happen to you. It just means that nothing will happen to you. Because Jesus has that kind of control. And he invites you to, to come and be his. That just means that nothing will ever happen to you that does not first pass through the banner of his love. Whatever, whatever does happen, you can know it only happened because Jesus allowed it and he has a good purpose for it in your life. We also see in this passage, Jesus not only controls nature, he also controls history. Look again at that dialogue that he has with Mary in the beginning of the passage. It, it's a really strange dialogue. In verse 3, she tells him that the wine has ran out. But look at his response in verse 4. What does he say to his mother? He says, woman, what does that have to do or what does this have to do with me? Who calls their mom woman? Nobody does. So, so why is he calling his mother that? Why is he being so rude? In reality, the word that's translated woman wasn't a rude word. It was actually a polite word. It was like saying ma'am. It'd be the modern equivalent of calling her ma'am, which is a polite word. But who calls their mom ma'am? It's just really strange and, and, and distant. And then the next phrase is less polite. When he says, what does this have to do with me? That was a somewhat common expression in their culture. And it wasn't rude but it was definitely a correction. It was a, a rebuke. So why is Jesus correcting his mom? Why is Jesus rebuking her? I think there are two parts to this rebuke. One is that Mary seems to be trying to get Jesus to fix the wine situation. She hears they've run out of wine, so she goes and tells Jesus about it. Like Jesus can do something. She expected him to do something about it. But that's not how it works with Jesus. Nobody has the right to expect Jesus to do anything, not even his own mother, because Jesus sets the agenda. Jesus is in control, and he will not be controlled by anybody. We see this multiple times throughout the Gospels where humans try to rope Jesus into their agenda. Where, where, where people, whether it's his mother or his disciples or others, where people bring their expectations to Jesus and expect him to go along with it. Remember that. We need to remember who Jesus is. We often try to set the agenda. We often try to get him to do what we want. We make the plans and we expect Jesus to help us with them. But that's not how Jesus works. Jesus makes the plans. Jesus is in control. Jesus is on a mission. That's why he tells Mary, my hour has not yet come. That's, that's sort of a, a code that Jesus likes to use. When he talks about his hour, he's talking about his death and resurrection. And so she approaches him and says, the wine has ran out and expects him to do a miracle. And his response is, my hour has not yet come. So there's a connection between him doing a miracle and his eventual death and resurrection. It's almost like he's saying, once I begin doing miracles, I begin the road to the cross. Once I begin doing miracles, I begin the road to the cross. Do you want me to go to the cross now? My hour has not yet come. If you think about it, it, it makes sense. Once Jesus starts doing miracles, what happens? He gets famous. Once he gets famous, the Jewish leaders notice him and they get jealous. They get offended by him. His fame spreads and the Roman leaders become aware of him and they start getting worried. 
well, this guy is gaining this huge following. There's all these reports of him doing miracles. Is he going to lead a rebellion? Is he going to cause us problems? Once he starts doing miracles, he becomes a threat. And ultimately, he became the kind of threat that had to be eliminated. So he has to be very careful about the miracles that he does. In the story, we see that, that he eventually decides to do this miracle. And I think he does it precisely because it's going to lead him to the cross. There's a pause. There's a moment where he's like, well, my hour has not yet come. But that hour, that cross is the reason that he came in the first place. He came to die. The cross was not an accident. The cross was the plan. And he executed the plan perfectly. You see, Jesus not only controls nature, he controls history. When he started getting famous for his miracles, that was not an accident. When he was put on trial by the Jews, that was not an accident. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Everybody else was planning and scheming, but he was 10 steps ahead the entire time. Starting here in this moment with his mother at the wedding, Jesus was 10 steps ahead the whole time. He knew what everybody else was going to do, what they were going to think, what they were going to try. He knew about their plans and their purposes, but ultimately his plans and his purposes prevailed. He was going to the cross, and he knew that it started here, and he was in control the entire time time. When you put your trust in Jesus, you are putting your trust in the one who controls history. Nothing is ever a surprise to him. We can talk about our frailty in nature and what nature can do to us, but we could also talk about what other people can do to us. We can also talk about our inability to manage events and, and outcomes We can talk about all the things that happen that that shock us and surprise us and derail our plans. Jesus never has his plans derailed, ever. Jesus is never surprised by any events. He is in control the entire time. He controls nature, he controls human hearts and human events, and he directs all of it for his purposes, his goals, and your purposes good. Now, what are his purposes? What are his goals? Jesus controls history, but to what end? Well, we see here that he controls history for the purpose of your salvation. My hour has not yet come, but he was planning. He was planning that hour all along, the hour of his death and resurrection the hour where he was going to accomplish your salvation. That's what he uses his power for. That's what he used his power for, was to get to the cross to die for you. Isn't that amazing? I'm sure you've heard the saying that power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And and it's sort of a, a strange saying because nobody actually has absolute power except for Jesus. Jesus is the one person in human history who ever possessed absolute power. He had power in a way that nobody else could ever dream of. He could have done anything. He could have done anything. Could have gotten whatever he wanted. He could have ruled the world in an instant and had all of the luxuries and the comforts and the pleasure. He could have had anything. And look at how he uses his power. He uses it to get himself killed for your sake. Jesus used his power to live the life that you should have lived and die the death that you deserved to die. We know that Jesus was our substitute on the cross, that he died the death that we deserve to die, but he also lived the life that we should have lived. We all live lives of sin against God. By God's grace, we are overcoming that sin and becoming more and more like Jesus. But we all live lives of sin and rebellion against God. We all live lives where we fail, where we ignore God, where we disobey God. And we know that we shouldn't. 
we all know what kind of lives that we should live, lives where we obey God and we honor him and we're always good to people and we're always loving and we always tell the truth, where, where we're always helping other people and we're never selfish and we're never greedy and we're never gossiping. We all know what lives we should live, good moral lives. Jesus lived the life that we should have lived. He was always perfectly good. He was never selfish. He was never greedy. He was never inappropriately angry. He was always completely loving. He always obeyed every single one of God's commands perfectly without fail. He lived a perfect life for us. His perfect life that he lived that was so pleasing to God the Father, that perfect moral resume that he built up over his 33 years, he gives that resume to us. So all that moral perfection and goodness that Jesus embodied, that's how God looks at you now. He looks at you through the lens of the righteousness of Christ. And he looks at you as not guilty because Christ paid the penalty on the cross for you. Paid in full. That's what he used his power for. He used it to save you. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. But his death is not the end. As Christians, we talk so much about the death of Jesus, as we should, but he also rose from the dead. And then after rising from the dead, he also ascended to the right hand of, of God the Father in a, in a place of honor and glory. And, and after that, he continued his work. Jesus is still working in the world today. So what's he working for? After all that he's accomplished, if he's still working, what's he working for? What's the plan? What's the purpose? Well, what did Jesus choose for his first miracle? What did he use his supernatural power for? He used it to make wine for a party. Jesus chose his first miracle to be the turning of water into wine for a party. A lot of wine. Over 120 gallons of wine. John gives us the numbers in the text, doesn't he? It says there's six jars between 20 and 30 gallons each. You do the math, that's between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. Because, why would he do that? Because that's what God promised would happen when the Messiah came. Look, look at the book of Amos. Look on your notes, this text from Amos chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. Throughout the Old Testament, the age of the Messiah is characterized by an abundance of of wine. That doesn't mean drunkenness, but it does mean celebration. It, that's where all of this is headed. That's Jesus' plan for history. It's, it's a celebration, a restoration of the fortunes of God's people, as the book of Amos describes. A redemption of all creation, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what he's saving us for. He's saving us from our sin and he's saving us for this total redemption of the entire universe that's going to culminate in a celebration in the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to culminate in an age when wine is flowing in abundance, signifying joy and, and life and peace and celebration. So we, we see then the ultimate purposes of God here in this text. We see his glory and our joy. Jesus did this to manifest his glory. He did this to, to kick off the messianic age, 
the age that was going to be characterized by an abundance of wine. It's going to be characterized by our joy and his glory. Remember the catechism. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we we thank you for saving us, for loving us. We thank you for inviting us into your plan of redemption for this world, for this entire universe. And, And we look forward to the completion of that redemption. We look forward to celebrating with you, Jesus. We look forward to celebrating with you. We love you and thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen.